Okay. Um, let's finish Nietzsche. Um, section nine, chapter nine. Uh, man alone with himself. Yes. Plus the epilogue. Um, so uh, this it's hard to do. This is very very aphoristic. There's a lot of really interesting aphorisms in here. Um, I kind of want to pick out a couple themes, and then we can do some individual points, and maybe we can wrap up. Um, so uh, I found this. I, I really I really enjoyed this one. I thought this is an excellent reading. Um, I found this chapter to if I wanted to kind of if I was ta telling telling someone who didn't read it about it, I guess I would say it's kind of about fighting and overcoming, attacking, danger, greatness, um, maybe uh, how to be leery of yourself, how to be leery of laziness, um, how, how to achieve kind of an intellectual, maybe a higher level of intellectual purity, or a higher level of intellectual, intellectual greatness, and actually, so my first theme here is, um, can, I, can you call this a theme? Was uh, laziness and thinking was my was one of the big themes in here. I think it came up again and again, and kind of through conviction, conviction, laziness, and 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 thinking. Uh, so conviction and laziness prevent us from growing uh, as as thinkers and as people. Um, I thought this was a big theme that ran throughout, throughout the whole thing. Um, and he's, I mean, it starts in 483, the very first one, he said, enemies of truth. I like this one a lot. Convictions are more dangerous enemies of truth than lies. Um, so, I guess, but doesn't, don't you think a lot of this boils down to um, we don't we don't want to criticize what makes us happy. Um, and uh, we take, a lot of people take as the standard of truth what makes them happy. Mm. And uh, this is where he says, like 517, this is fundamental insight that well-being and truth are not necessarily linked. I mean, a lot of these you can work out from this, right? Um, people really think, well, it makes me feel good, so why, why how could it be wrong? Uh, and I think all of this, this is kind of intellectual laziness, or um, is bo basically boils down to, I don't want to have to look at nasty things. So don't show them to me. Don't make me think of them. And I, I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. Don't make me look at origins. Uh, don't make me think about why I'm doing what I'm doing, because it's going to make me unhappy. What do you think? I think it, it kind of, in general, he's this is his accusation against these type of people who hold convictions that they have this kind of lazy and also he says they. I'm just going to make a big jump here at the end. He, he can he accuses these people of lacking a certain kind of justice, um, and they they lack a strong sense of justice. They don't give a kind of justice to other points of view. The only point of view they're willing to consider is their own, and uh, that and that makes them feel good. And any point that is not their own makes them feel bad because it questions what they're doing. So they throw it out, and they don't want to consider it at all. Hey, Bill O'Reilly, imagine that. O'Reilly. <laughs> what do you think? I think that's like probably the strongest theme in here. No. Mm. Yes. Yes. No, it's kind of interesting. And and should I? You want to stick uh, with what we got here, or can I expand on this a little bit? Expand, expand away. Yeah, go and, for it. It was also kind of interesting how, um, in connection to this, this he talks a lot about professions, things, things, and I was kind of wondering how this ties into into this theme of like you know convictions and more importantly that, that kind of laziness. Mm. This, you know, he has that one about um, uh, five eleven, those faithful to their convictions. Machines, and where he's almost he seems to be um, suggesting that these kind of these convictions machines, take up time for thinking. Okay, you know, we could be thinking, but we're too busy to protect our convictions. I think he's most. Well, this was 
seem to speak about religion. You know, you're too busy going through through religious ceremony to actually think about what you're doing. Right now. Thing, but you know, he has. Thank you, good reader, for crashing on me right when I try to talk. <laughs> but um, then he has a couple of sections about professions. Shins. And the first one kind of seems seems like I'm not really sure what his opinion of it is, where he says that um, um, professions are. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so. Is that 492? Um, Men rarely can really endure a profession which they do not believe or could eat themselves is at the bottom more important than any other. That one? Um, actually, that's, that one is also the theme, but I, I want to think of a. Um, 437. No, 537, sorry. 537. Value of a profession. A profession makes one thoughtless. Therein, it li therein lies its greatest blessing, for it is a rampart behind which one can lawfully retreat when one is assailed by commonplace cares and scruples. As here, he seems to... It's almost curious as to whether this is assailing or supporting professions, because you know, it makes one thoughtless unless you retreat behind it. It it seems to to be similar similar in the vein of 491, on, on where he talks about how people aren't actually seeing themselves; they only see themselves from the outside. Side. So it's, he seems critical of it in this. But then later on, let's see if I can find it. Yeah, at 575, uh, he says a profession is the backbone of life. Which here, this you know seems to be very very strongly in. In um, support of professional, professional well, pursuits, so I was kind of curious, you know. And of course, the one you brought up, where he, where he says, you know, a profession is, you know, people aren't willing to, to do professions they view as less important and than others. There's, so I'm really curious as to whether he sees this, these professions as something that's important and self-empowering, or is something that falls into this distracting us from, from our intellectual pursuits. I think he definitely wants, I mean, I mean, I don't know, I kind of feel like he probably has a, a very complex relationship with this. Um, I think he, he can see, and this is so true, that people hide in their profession. Isn't this true in, even in your life? I mean, think, I mean, and, and this is true in anyone's life. Uh, when you are, you feel bad, what do you do? Well, so some people escape into art, but some people escape into their job, right? They want some, you know, set process that they can do and never have to think about, and they can they totally escape from anything. Uh, they don't have to think about their life. They don't have to think about their problems. I'm just going to do my job. And I think people escape from this, escape their lives via their jobs constantly. Um, if we're gonna, if we're gonna, I mean, this is easily run into Japan, easily. Mm. Um, what do you think? Like, I mean, what what is? I liked Ikegami Akira. He said on TV uh, a while ago with Matsuko Deluxe. They were talking about how uh, Japanese men stay at their companies and like Ikegami, Mr. Ikegami. He his I liked his opinion a lot. He said like, look, um, these guys don't want to go home because they don't have a position at home. They're not valued at home. They're valued at work, right? And they don't want to have to. I mean, I'm sure they run to work to escape the fact that they don't have a place at home. I mean, I, I this is I just I think it's straight up true. I mean, but like the point about uh, profession being a backbone of life, I I think you could have a profession without escaping to it, though, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it can provide it can provide a stability in your life. It can it it can you can draw your skill, you can practice your skill, as long as you're not using it as an escape. So, um, he's, perhaps he's seeing profession as a necessary but dangerous element of life? Perhaps. You know, as the, you know, you have to, because it gives you substance, it stabilizes you, gives you, you su support in more ways than one. Mm. But, you risk it ri risks becoming similar to a conviction. Okay. Might be his stance. I I think I mean I I think he must have something like this. I don't. I think he sees that this is what people do to escape, but I don't think he he wants to eliminate professions. 
by any means either. Mm. So I don't know. Um, that was an interesting observation. I really didn't pick out the professions thing in this one. There's so there's some so many interweaving themes in this. I didn't pick that one out. Um, I like it. Um, um, I kind of what what do you think about this? I was I was thinking about this as I was reading as far as convictions. Um, so. He talks, Nietzsche talks about this a lot. People, he says, people want to hold convictions because we look down on people who change their convictions. Yes. <laughs> and uh, this is what he mentions at the end. He says, like, I mean, he says this is this speaks ill of con, uh, uh, con, uh, convictions because um, we assume that the only reason somebody would ever change their convictions is because they have some kind of dirty little advantage to gain from something else. So they must be like a lowly person. And it, they would never, you would never change your convictions from intellectual honesty. What? Right? I mean, this doesn't occur to people. It always, it's like, it's kind of a, well, you must have some dirty little secret. Or you're That's why you're changing it. Or you're a hypocrite, right? That's why you're changing your convictions. Yeah, um, yeah, I mentioned that uh, thing about great, great tasks. If you try, you try to do something great and then realize you can't do it, that you're usually too afraid to change, to say, sorry, I've, I've changed because this, and then you just become a hypocrite by default. Mm, 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 mm. Yes. Exactly right. <laughs> if you kind of overvalue yourself, um, what, what, do you, what do you think? Why? Um, why? Just looking at this whole one in general, why would you say why do people want to make their life look like it's unified in the first place? Mm. Like, like they, like they have this conviction. That's continuing on. Um, it's unchanging. They 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 want it to look like like he mentions that men is bad poets. There's a section men is bad poets where they started with an idea, but the idea kind of dies away. But they just out of pure vanity, people want to make it look like their life has some kind of consistency because that makes them look good. Um, so what, what do you think? Where does that come from? This idea that you want it to look like your life has some kind of consistency. I mean, do, is it because people are afraid of being wrong? Um, I think, I mean, less than being afraid of wrong, what I would think is people want to think that their entire life has had value. So That's interesting, like, like it led to something. Yes, my entire life has led up to this. I've been on, you know, th I've been on this path uh, towards where I am now throughout my entire life. So everything throughout my life up until this point has had meaning because it's been a consistent and struggle to get to where I am. Mm, I like that. I'll take a crack at that too. Then I'll I'll, I'll say that um, the reason why is because the one thing people fear more than anything else is change. Mm. Change is the one thing that is feared, even above pain. Um, People would rather People actually endure pain, yeah. Endure pain rather than change. Change is the scariest thing in someone's life. And your stress is high when you change your job or you change your apartment. Mm. Change it change is what we fear the most, and that is the theme of this book. Um, mm. dealing directly with our fear of change. Ooh, I like that. Um do you think can I ask an even further question then? Like, um why fear change? Is it a fear of being out of control, no. or um, is it a fear of the unknown? Well, I mean, probably those two coupled with a fear of the unknown. Mm. Yeah. You know, you know, to look back and you know everything I'm doing up to now, it's fine. Fine, my life is fine. I mean, I mean, so if something changes, just me, my life won't be fine afterwards. Mm. You know, it's, then I'll have to admit that, that change was. A bad choice. Mm, yeah. You know, it's kind of like with um, you know, we've all all worked in you know Japanese. It's especially apparent in Japanese schools. Well, as, well as when it comes to um the Taik side, I in particular is one. You know, when they you know, they, we sit down in the meeting, meeting for this Taik side, and everyone's like, okay, what event should we have in our Taik our our Taik side our sports festival? So, well. Well, let's have the same ones we had last year. Okay? Hey, 
hey, how should we have the opening ceremonies? It is Vane and Dodi, same, same as last year. Mm-hmm. Or same as previous year, years. Um, because if you change, you change it for the worse. There's, and of course, there's, since this is a, these are teachers, there's a professional last, but there's also the fear of responsibility in, the, in this particular example. But yeah. that, I mean, that's, I, what, I, that's what I wanted to say, is, that's to build up here, is that the fear of change is the fear of responsibility, taking responsibility for your decisions. That's yeah. why they don't change anything. Because they're like, well, if it was fine last year, yeah. what can they say to me this year? Yeah. If that's what they did before, what's the worst they could say to me now? Yeah. All I can say to them is, well, that's what we did before. Fear of responsibility, coupled with that, that is, sparks the fear of change. And mm. the fear that you, you can change your life or that you are in control of your life. Mm. Wow, I yeah. like that. Like, I have to admit, I'm going to admit, I'm just going to come right out and say, like, I do fear a change um, so do in small th- in my life. Like, uh, my job, like, I change between different areas, and every time, even though it, I've done it many times, every year I go back and forth, every time I get extremely nervous at the change. It, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that I have to change. Mm. Um, I, 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 maybe yeah, I feel like I'm out of, I'm out of control, like I'm going to screw up, like I'm going to... Maybe you know, maybe something about me is going to be revealed that I'm I'm not as good as I thought I was going to be. Um, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. Like that's the scarier thought is like yeah, that I actually have control over my life too, right? That I could actually just quit this whole job, right? And I could do something else too, right? Um, yeah. I do. It, it does. I have to admit, when I do change, I do reflect on my life quite a bit. I'm like, should I really be doing this? Shouldn't I be doing something else? And usually the something else is something a lot more stable with no change. But uh, <laughs> uh, I have to admit, I do those thoughts cross my mind every time, every single time. Mm. And I can imagine, Jim, you know, since we, you know, Dustin brought the fear of real, you know, realizing you have the ability to change your life. Life also so ties back into the fear of responsibility because then that also so it gives you responsibility for everything you don't like about your current life. That's right. Uh, That's you know, right. Not, yeah, if, if I could somehow get myself out of this situation where I, that where I have elements of my life that make me un, unhappy, if for say, for example, uh, if I could, you know, uh, that I would have to admit that the reason, you know, all of my the unhappiness I felt up to this point was my own damn fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's a really tough thing. And, wow. I, I really think fear of change is one of the most fundamental fears that we have. Mm. Wow, yeah, I have, I have to agree. So conviction is um, a kind of bulwark against change. Mm. Mm. Um, or a fortress, that, a fortress that prevents change. Um, people are kind of praised for having convictions, though. He's a man of conviction. Even, even now, I mean, this is not like... Ancient history. I mean, a man, he's a man of convictions. Is something that's firmly approved of these days. Mm. Um, yeah, you only say that about people you agree with, though. So. Yeah. Usually. Because sometimes yeah, so. you don't. But, like, you could say that about O'Reilly, I guess. He's a man of convictions. I hate him for it. But. <laughs> well, yeah. That's, you, know, you have to get to a pretty intellectual level to be able to say that. Yeah. But generally, you know. If you have the same convictions, and you you respect them for the, their convictions. If they don't, you call them stubborn. Yeah, exactly. Which is what I would like to call around. <laughs> <laughs> and this this theme also is four ninety two, four four ninety four. Goal and path. Many are obstinate with with regard to the path. Once they have entered upon it, few with regard to the goal. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it just. All, all this time, and even like uh, the last psychologist to the last psychiatrist to, and in Lacanian theories, and like the fear of change. I mean, that's just a big thing in in, in modern life. I mean, in psychology too, the fear of change is, is one of the, the darkest, most fundamental psychological fears there are. I mean, just look at how children react to to different situations. They'd rather have a stable situation. 
more than a happy situation, I think, sometimes. Right? Sometimes they'll blame themselves. Because it, it, it like, you know, like the utilitarian people say, well, like, people are only over happiness. But kids will blame themselves for problems that they don't have control of before they will ever start thinking like, well, this is an out-of-control universe or my parents really don't love each other, right? They'll blame themselves for their parents' divorce before they'll just have, you know, before they'll say like, well, my parents didn't really love each other and things are never going to be the same, yeah. right? They'll blame themselves first. Yeah, because they, they'd have to change their perception of reality. You know, they've all, you know, they saw their parents as loving. Yeah, in that case too, maybe it's about control too, that the kids think that maybe... Maybe that if they did something, they would have control over the situation. If they were a better person, they would have control over the situation. That fits fits in with the themes of God too, right? I think that really fits in with. Uh, I really, I really, I don't know why when this comes up, I like it because maybe it was. It affected. It was in my life. So I, I like five seventy four where he says, uh, "He who has boldly foretold the weather three times and each time <laughs> successfully believes a little in the depths of his soul that he is prophetically gifted. We accept the existence of the miraculous and irrational when it flatters our self esteem." Yeah, it's so true. Um, so, like, is is if it puts you in control, the anything irrational is fine. Like, oh, thank God, yes, now I can use uh, the secret and the laws of attraction. I'm finally back in control, right? So that is that possibly why you're willing to use miracle to refer to your delicious karage, but not to refer to, uh, <laughs> to being spared by tsunami? I, 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 yes. I mean, this is something I like. This this theme that when it comes up, I, um, I, I am. Um, I do find this kind of thinking is lacks a certain integrity to me. Like it really does. I really think that these these type of people who believe this they they throw away intellectual integrity just to feel good. And I don't know. Just these days, I've I've had it up to here with uh, people who believe things because it makes them feel good. Mm. Uh, I mean, my whole life, my whole life, I've seen people who believe things just because it makes me feel good. Um, well, I'm sorry. That's it's not exactly something praiseworthy. Uh, I mean, you yeah. have to admit it's incredibly powerful. It is. Oh God, yes, it is. I mean, yeah, I think Nietzsche, this is something Nietzsche is wrestling with. The whole section, right. he's he's like slowly pulling at this idea from all directions, um, and he sees this. And I, maybe I don't know. Maybe maybe he even sees maybe this is something we're fated to. To a certain extent, like we're gonna be wrestling with this forever. Um, are, are we gonna anyway. continue on conviction, or should we? I do have another theme. I do too. I, I do too. And uh, convictions too. Right. Maybe this should wait till the end. Okay. Well, if if it's kind of an end thing, I want to take it to one that's kind of in the middle, okay. more in the middle, uh, which I think we'll all have something to say on. Uh, I think there's a theme of, uh, um, in a weird way, surface and depth in this one. A uh, surface and depth come up again and again, deep and shallow, uh, full and partial views. Inner um, and outer. Inner and outer, right? Um, how, how much can you see? How sharp is your eye, right? This is this comes up again and again and again and again. I mean, and for example, 40, I like 49 a lot, just on the first page. Uh, people who comprehend a thing to its very depths rarely stay faithful to it, for they have brought its depth into the light of the day, and in the depths there is always much that is unpleasant to see. Mm. Um, right. So, I mean, and also there was the one about um, people take more seriously obscure things than clear things. Oh, wow, I was like, ouch. Um, that is a dangerous aphorism, but it's true. I find it's true. Mm. Um, people will go on and on about the power of love, um, but they won't talk about my pencil. Um, so, I mean, like, uh, they, I think they do, this fits in with the whole book in general. Um, I think they, they want to add this kind of metaphysical zone for something like the power of love that comes out of the sky and it's magical, and that's good. It's separate from all this dirty stuff down here. Um, I think Nietzsche wants to say, like, maybe right, the, the deeper you can see the more you're going to see everything is grounded in these 
eviler ideas, and that people in general don't want to see more. They want to see less. Uh, for example, the one you said about the castle. People don't want to see more. They don't want to see deeper into themselves because it makes them unhappy. Mm. It makes the, it's unpleasant. It, it, it's unpleasant to see. So I don't want to see more. I want to see less. No, um, on that note, I just want to that one about the castle for 491. And I yeah. find it very interesting because it ties back into the previous section, doesn't it? Yes. Ooh, which one? Which one? Which part? Because um, the one the previous section was about one of the major themes running through that was how much other people see about you that you don't mm. um, realize. In this one, he says, you know, well, okay, your your fortress is it's, it's a fortress against yourself. Of you mm. don't you won't see inside of this fortress. You won't see deeply into yourself until you know the actual force is, is inaccessible, even invisible to him and the person with the fortress, unless his friends, friends and enemies kind of he throws that in there. Or play traitor and conduct him in, a, in by secret path. So you have to have your friends to actually tell you, you know, what type of a person. You know, your friends are seeing inside of your little castle wall. And stuff. Well, I like that part a lot. I think the last part of that was excellent. Yeah, I want to, I want to talk about that too. Um, like how maybe your best access to yourself is not yourself. Mm. Your best access to yourself is outside of yourself. Mm. Um, even like. This is in the gay science, but I mean, even through language itself, which is something you haven't created, right? You you kind of brought outside of yourself in order that you can see yourself even clearer. Mm. I like that a lot. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there's a uh, great uh, there's a great Jack Handy deep thoughts about that. What right? did he uh, say? Remember Jack Handy's deep thoughts by Jack Handy on Saturday Night mm. Live? Yeah. Uh. Went, something like this. He's like. Um, one time, I heard a rumor in my neighborhood that there was a really big jerk living somewhere in my neighborhood. So I went next door and asked the guy. I, I, I went to explore and asked the guy. And he said, I pointed to a house and said, is that the guy that's the big jerk? And he said to me, no, that's, that's not him. He, the guy, the, the jerk, lives over there. And so I said to him, you asshole, that's my house. <laughs> <laughs> right, so he needed someone else to tell him that he was the neighborhood jerk. Right, you need you get access to your yourself <laughs> in certain ways through through your interactions with other people. Mm -hmm. Well, even then, then for a more you know, I can think of myself a great street fighter if I only play by myself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, some stuff you, you just can't know without other people. Mm. I mean, it's Im impossible. For example, if you are nice, mm. you can't know that a lot. I, 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 what are you talking about? I'm totally nice. <laughs> right. I'm the nicest I, person in the world, damn it. You can be like the nicest person on Neptune, right? You know what I mean? Like, it would be like the easiest. Right? <laughs> Easiest thing, right? There's no one else, so. <laughs> well, yeah, I've always is now. Feel free to assail the statement, and it, and as it is very assailable. I've always thought confidence is, is an ability to ignore the obvious. In a good way or a bad way? Um, well, for example, well, well, if I were to. To say I'm great at Street Fighter, there, which you know I, I'm I'm not by the way no, no by no means is, but it would be possible for me to say that to feel 100% confident in my Street Fighter abilities if I could ignore all the times I've lost, mm -hmm. all the people who are better than me. The, by ignoring them, I can be confident in my abilities. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're even if I was, you know, spectacular at Street Fighter. Where if I was, if I'm really looking around, I'd always be second guessing myself. Yeah. Can this? Can, can, I, can I take this to? This, can I don't know. I'm, I'm sure if we can. I want to take this to this. These two sections on half knowledge. Mm. I love those two sections on yes, half knowledge. Uh, we talked about like foreign languages are more pleasurable to speak when you say when you only speak a little. Right, but then you become fluent 
that kind of disappears. And I found, yeah. Yes. Uh, I had a lot of fun learning Japanese. A lot. But now I just use it to buy bread. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yes, you know, I, when I've talked with you know, the the some uh, you know people who are less proficient and and people are constantly constantly really bragging about their abilities. It's like, oh, do you know this word? What's this word in Japanese? Oh, well, you know, here's this word in Japanese. What does it mean? This is a huge topic of conversation. Shen, Shen, two pe you know these people who are just coming in, just learning the language. Whereas I don't think I've ever ever had one of these. Conversations with either of you. Unless I actually didn't know what it was. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> then, then I'll yeah, ask you. Yeah. yeah, if you you guys used a word, well, I think this has happened a couple of times. You know, you use a a word I don't understand. I I would say, okay, what is the? Yes, but. But it's a mundane process. Yeah, I mean, like the first time I heard Jojaku, I was like, what? What is Jojaku? Right, so I had to ask around, but I mean, it really wasn't all that big loss for me that I didn't stand Jojaku. Right. How are you going to read two channel if you don't know? That's true. Yeah. I, a, you, I, yeah, I guess it's video. kind of funny that it's, you would say that because by not knowing it, you were a Jojaku. Jojaku. Wow. Yes, levels. 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 It's yeah. meta now. It's meta. <laughs> uh. So, but I mean, like I think Nietzsche wants to say, we, this was the other one. He kind of wants to say, right, like, there's a pleasure in half knowledge that allows for a kind of action, an action unavailable to someone who knows much more, right? Uh, who would lose that confidence you were mentioning about Street mm -hmm. Fighter? Um, you, you have that. You can have the wild, cocky guy who thinks he's the bo the bomb because he's forgot. He's conveniently forgotten every time he's lost, mm. right? It's like, yeah, I can make. I've actually heard somebody say this. The, the, I can can do the short. I can do short. You can accurately lean ninety percent of the time. I'm so the bomb at Street Fighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, anyway, that has no sorry, the, the, that has nothing to do with the conversation, but <laughs> no, no, I, I like it. Yeah, I mean, I think. To, to a certain extent, this whole thing about service and depth, I mean, it fits in with the previous one. I, I think he really wants to say, like, a lot of people, I mean, either they got, you know, they just got crap to do, and they don't want, they can't afford to think deeply, or, um, or laziness, or it hurts too much. Uh, so people don't want to see what's there. They f fight against seeing what's there, especially in seeing... Origins of things, um, and but one of my favorite, my favorite one. And this is five eighty seven. Um, in this theme, I, I put it in this theme, which was um, to attack or to intervene. Where he talked about, um, we often make the mistake of actively opposing a tendency or party or age, because we happen to have seen only its external side. Uh, but he says, uh, he talks a little bit more, um, it requires to be sure, at the end he says, it requ requires to be sure a more penetrating eye and a more favorable inclination to advance what is imperfect and involving, evolving than to see through, its, th see through it in its imperfection and deny it. In other words, we, you mean you look at something, you see it has a couple mistakes, so you just throw it out. Mm. Because that's, uh, you don't have time. To, to, to sit down and think about what's good in it, what you can take out of it, what you can learn from it. Just, just oh, it's wrong, out. Yeah, that's, right. the, that's the reaction people have to, like, Plato. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. Or Freud. Mm. Yes. Or oh, Prometheus. God, Freud so much, yes. Or? Prometheus. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or Prometheus, yes. yes. That, you're right, yeah, there's a lot of... Stuff to be sifted through there, although I will defend it. Actually, considering our conversation yesterday, Dustin, we had about the movie The Mist, maybe yeah. I had this attitude toward The Mist, too. I kind of... I blew don't, the don't, movie don't, off. Don't, don't get me... Don't, don't make me think that I don't think that there are flaws in the film. There are flaws in the film. So don't just... But I... There are, there's a reason it's a horror classic, and there are mm -hmm. deeper themes in there, but 
there's there's something to be thought about. It's a little mini society. It's just yeah, like I get what you're saying. But don't get me to say that I think the miss is a masterpiece. Because that is not. <laughs> That's for it's sure. Cer- it's certainly not a masterpiece. But I think I could have spent a little bit more time. Mm. I didn't realize how acclaimed it I just watched it for the hell of it. Mm. I, I was like, oh the miss, that sounds good. Uh, I didn't realize what a the level it had achieved by the time I had watched it, I guess. Yes. Um the maybe book, I would the have... book had, by the way. The mm. book. The movie here, I think Project Arrowhead, which is the project that unleashed the mist. I mean, that's it, referenced in a lot of video games and other places too. So I mean, the mist is a very culturally huge thing. Mm. Although for me, like you know, for example, the, me for the religious woman was she was a little too over the top. Yeah. So. Every time I watch the film, film. Man. I, I've seen the film about four or five times now because it's on cable here sometimes, and every time she's way over the top for me. Mm. Just like in Prometheus when that ship is rolling forward, and I'm like, just go to the left. You know, there's nothing you can do to get, you know, you just have to laugh there. I mean, that's just... <laughs> why, why, or like the fact that the geologist gets lost, and you're like, why, why, why? There are bigger themes in the movie Prometheus. There really are. And... Just as a weird like side, you know what I thought? The first thing I thought was not a movie. I thought of Kuramati Koko. <laughs> um, and like, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, that Afro joke telling guy? Yes. Remember him? He was, he was obsessed with figuring out why professional comedians were, were successful. And he saw this act on TV and he was like, that's stupid. How, how these guys are lame? How could they possibly be successful? But then he stops them. He's like, No, 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 no. That's an amateur opinion. I got to figure out what it, what is good in here. What what are what are people yeah. getting out of this, right? Uh, and I, I really like that. I mean, a Kurumati Koko in general is an excellent manga. I uh, I'm trying to build my collection of Kurumati Koko back up here from book off, but uh, reminded me of that scene. I don't know why. Uh, yeah. yeah. That was my favorite section uh, of, of the theme of surface and depth. Um, this is going to be extremely complicated, though. Um, I think the idea of surface surface and depth, though. It, we, it's not going to turn out to be like, depth is better than surface. Um, as Nietzsche evolves, this idea is going to get extremely complex, I think. He's, he's um, going to praise the Greeks. For being... Exactly. He's going to praise the surface. Um, and I agree. I kind of I'm I'm on this page. I'm actually I'm kind of I'm almost weirdly on the surface page, but I'm not for intellectual bankruptcy either, right? Mm. So um, we're gonna I mean, this... it, it, that theme of, for example, how much truth can you handle? Mm. Is gonna, it's gonna hand, it's gonna go into Nietzsche too. By the way, right to the end, the greatest thinkers can handle the most evil truths, right? Mm. The dark, the deepest thinkers, and it's like it's 49, not too deep, right? I mean, the same thing you could say about when we had the section on love, too. I mean, I suppose you could make a Nietzsche test about how much do you really love someone is how much you're really willing to see everything that they are. Mm. At least now, this Nietzsche now, right? You might say something like, well, now we'll test yourself. I mean, see t- to her or his inner depths and see how much you can take and still love them. Right? So Nietzsche's recommend scatology? <laughs> perhaps, perhaps not that much. But okay. uh, those are the inner depths. Uh, anyway. Actually, maybe you can find more horrifying stuff when you talk to someone, though. Actually, I know. Like, I'd be more, <laughs> I'd be more afraid of them if they were racists. Yeah. Than if they were into scat. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that was, I mean, that was the Sega Control and Assault Team, first of yeah. all. Yeah. Yeah. In, 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 in oh. Night Trap. The Night Trap. Oh my God. Night Trap. The Night Trap reference. Oh my God. Of course, there was, there was you know, one of the, the greatest musicians, Scatman. Scatman, yes. <laughs> you could be in Scat in all He's kinds in of ways. The, in the Scat. All different kinds of Scat. Uh, oh, I love Scat. <laughs> it's it's interesting. interesting. I was watching this uh, thing. I'm going to quote you on that later. <laughs> That's true. I, I love, love Scat, Jesse. <laughs> I love Scat. <laughs> I, I, was, I was watching this interview uh, Zizek had on uh, uh, Slovenian TV, um, and he was talking about his son, 
who's going to raise his son. And the guy, the interviewer on Slovenian TV said, because um, I mean, Zizek is big into communism, and he's like, so are you going to raise your son to be communist? And Zizek said, you know, no, actually my son has already given me a lecture about how communism just encourages laziness. And uh, he thought, Zizek thought it was hilarious, right? He's already become this, like, proto-capitalist. Uh, <laughs> his six-year-old son has already become this kind of proto-capitalist who's giving his father lectures about how communism could never work in the real world. Uh, I, I, I like the fact that Zizek thought it was hilarious. Uh, but, like, um, he said, like, there's only two things I want out of my son. He said, um, one, that he doesn't discriminate. And two, that he knows the value of studying. Other, everything else he can decide for himself. Uh, as long as he has these two things, anything he does is fine. Hmm. And I, I really respected that. I thought it was a really great answer. I kind of it changed my view, and I think I kind of want to aim for that myself. Um, hmm. Don't discriminate, and know the value of studying. And I think you're you're on a really good track. And take care of me when I'm old. Yeah, <laughs> take care of him. Well, Zizek's gonna is the net the star of philosophy star, so he'll have enough money, I think. <laughs> I, actually, I don't know. I'm just imagining. I don't know what how much money Zizek has. Uh, I hope he has enough. Um, so, uh, I, as far as big themes, uh, that's kind of all I'm really prepared to talk about. I wish I had more time, but those are the two ones I wanted to bring up. Um, before we do any individual ones, Dustin, do you want to talk about like this one at the end, or do you want to do individual sections and then talk about this? Sure. One? I just want to talk about. I'll talk about this at the end. Then okay. I want to ask you a question if you thought this was a theme, and then let's talk about individual ones. Um, I just the thing at the end. I just, I just want to ask an open question. Um, he suggested in the end, and this is what I really like because this is the theme of the book too is that you can't discount history. And he suggested that actually convictions were what set us on the path of truth. Um, he suggested in the last big aphorism, very big aphorism that he had on convictions, he said, look, the reason why we have a science of, of understanding what truths are and what, what is the truth is because two people with different convictions met one day and there was no compromise. So they had to, when there was these clashes of will, until finally we had to come up with a science of figuring out what was more true or not. Right, so through multiple people having convictions, the science of truth was born. So he's not dismissing convictions either. But he's not going to let you stay in a lower, that's why he calls it a lower level of culture, right? Um, to have these convictions, but convictions are what gave birth to the science of truth, and I like that idea. So can we say that convictions are are damaging to the individual, but potentially beneficial to mankind? Yeah, especially early, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure I'm sure Nietzsche would never say like we should have never ever had convictions, right? I don't think he would say that. At least not mm. this Nietzsche. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I didn't really get that feeling either. It was, a, it was a process. I kind of felt, yeah, it just kind of feels they hold you back. They hold you from growing more. Right. This is the This is the next level, right? So in other words, mm. it was nothing, and then these convictions, and now the science of truth. And that's why helping these convictions, it's, it's there, but it's at a lower level. It seems like that's what he's saying. Mm. But it's not as if they weren't necessary at one point. Which I really liked. I mean, when you when you think about it, it kind of seems like, yeah, I mean, why would you... What would prompt you to, to start thinking about your own ideas is the confrontation with another that rigorously holds no. Right? Everything's not water. It's air. Yeah, you stupid. Everything's... No, it's not. It's void. It's void, that's right. Void. It's eyes. <laughs> Uh, okay, and then I guess a theme I want to... I don't even know if it's a theme, but we can talk about emotions a little bit because we had a book, whole book on emotions. Yeah. And here he kind of toys with this idea that emotions are kind of like this boiler system where 
you pour enough in and then you explode, there was kind yeah. of an effort. So I'm like, you just need to drop more and then yeah, someone that, that one drop. Um, yeah. That's, that was pretty much a um, more complex version of, you know, the strong growth of is back, right? Yeah. Right, exactly. So that that was something that I guess Solomon kind of fell away from, but Nietzsche does have a kind of really interesting sophisticated view of emotions. If you look at, for example, first he kind of suggests that you have your feelings first, and then you kind of rationalize your feelings mm -hmm. later, right? For example, in 557... Okay. Uh, I, wanted, I should have mentioned this, yeah. I wanted to talk 557, about this he says, uh, upon people one cannot endure. One seeks in one's mind, own mind to cast suspicion. He's kind of suggesting that first you have the feeling about the man, mm -hmm. and then you have the rationale that goes with it. Or 596, too. Um, 596, he says, um, the, the prince, having resolved on a war with his neighbor, discovers that causes belly uh, is like a father who points upon his child a mother who is henceforth to come to such, right? I mean, like, you decide on to go to war, and then you decide the reason to go to war. Much like the Iraq War. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No. Oh. Uh, so, right, first comes the emotion then comes the rationale mm. for the emotion, right? It's, But it's not as easy as that for Nietzsche, I think. Because I was sitting there, I was like, oh, is this a theme that he's saying that you rationalize your own emotions? But example, for example, what do you think of then a 492, the right profession? We'll go back to professions. Men can rarely endure a profession of which they do not believe or convince themselves that is at bottom more important than any other. Is it an interesting that it's sometimes... You you rationalize your convictions, but sometimes your rationale changes your emotion, right? Isn't that what he's saying? Is like you kind of end up you have to believe it, so you end up kind of feeling like this is the best person for you. Is that what's going on here? Right? It's a little bit more. Or for example, four eighty six, mm. four eighty six, when he says, "The one thing needful, there is one thing one has to have." Either a cheerful disposition by nature, or a disposition made cheerful by art and knowledge. Um, so he's kind of playing with both, right? He's saying, well, you justify your own emotions, but sometimes your reason makes you feel different things. I mean, all this really comes down to is that Emotions really are their own kind of rationale. I mean, he, this is what he's going to later dawn upon, right? That emotions do have rationales of their own. Yes. Right? That, that they're not just random things that you feel. That, that there, there is rationale behind even emotions, and they all have their little bit of reason to them. So I like how he's, he's not simply one-sided on this. And he's going to play both sides, and this is going to lead him to his discovery that emotion, too, has reason. It's, they're together. They're not separate at all. Although sometimes emotion is bad reason. Mm. I, I know. I, I like. I like. I don't know. Could you apply this to six oh eight and six ten? I want to talk about these two. I mean, this goes back to the first theme. I thought it was uh, cause confused with effect. This is just straight up. Mm. But um, he says we we unconsciously seek principles for our own temperament. Yes. Uh, and then later say, I have this temperament because uh, these principles led me to it. So what are you going to do? I mean, I remember a uh, Saul sitting with uh, Ivan Saul uh, when he was teaching Schopenhauer. And uh, he said one day in class, he said, like, um, he said about Schopenhauer, he said, Schopenhauer wasn't writing the world as well in representation. And then when he got to, like, section 36, he didn't just realize that the world was hell. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't just, like, writing the book, and then he's like, wait a second, the world is hell. Wow, I just I just concluded that, right? I was like, hmm, yeah, I'd probably not. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, maybe if he, if, if he actually, if Schopenhauer actually thought that, you know, like, oh, well, you know, I just reasoned it out, what? Uh, maybe, like, this, this would be directed at that. But I think, I like what Nietzsche says here at the end. He says, uh, why? Why do we do this? And he, he doesn't lay this at the feet. He lays this at the feet of laziness. Yeah. Um, so uh, 
we're we're destined for it from indolence and love of ease and vanity. Um, that's why we seek this stuff out. So I mean, it, I, it's possible to circumvent this, right? It's it's possible to go around this if you're willing to make that extra work. But mm -mm. I do, I agree. Like, I think Nietzsche is going to come later and add a rationality to the individual emotions because the emotions just don't appear out of nothing. Right. I mean, it's not like... I don't, I don't think he gets there totally, but he does have several aphorisms that make you think. And that's what's going to lead up to Robert Solomon, right? I don't know if he ever totally gets there or not. It's hard to tell. I don't know. But does he? I mean, like, in a weird way, I, it's almost like for, I, whenever, when I first heard Robert Solomon... Um, way many years ago in his first book on the passions. It, it, even Freud, Mr. Hydraulic Model himself, I mean, Robert Solomon's main, one of his big points in that first book was like, look, uh, look, Freud, actually, you believe exactly what I say, and you've believed it the whole time. Just the foundation is wrong. Right. That's, that's Just get rid of the foundation, and, and Freud, because what you, well, Freud, what you say, and what, what's interesting in what you say is everything I'm saying. Um, so get rid of this weird hydraulic model, and everything I say works. If you keep the hydraulic model, then what you say doesn't work, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think this, I mean, if Nietzsche believes this here, I think the same point can be made about Nietzsche. I mean, what Nietzsche is saying always, constantly, is he's talking about the rationale. He's talking about the logic of the emotions. And if the emotions didn't work with the logic, um, what he's saying wouldn't even make sense. Yeah. So yeah. I, I would, that's what I would do here, too. I would just, if, if he did believe any of this, I would just cut it right out and keep all, anything that was really meaningfully interesting, we can keep. Yeah, I mean, there was some really interesting leading aphorisms, and there was that one aphorism that was very hydraulic, I suppose you could say. Um, mm. But... I, I thought it was an interesting theme, kind of. I don't know if it was a theme in here, but it was certainly here. So, all right, that's all I have. Anybody else knows the, there was a there was a thump, a sub theme, um, but there was one on like leadership. Yep, running through here. I was gonna. I was preparing a third theme on greatness. I think there's a theme of what does it mean to be great in many ways. Um, but I'm not really ready. I wasn't ready to talk about it, so I mm. just didn't. Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I agree. There is a theme of leadership and greatness. I want to add, expand it to greatness, like greatness, yeah. nobility, intellect, and especially intellectual greatness. Uh, you know, it seems like differ between I mean, two types of le leaders. I think. I mean, you know, the he talks about the, the river, where that's you know it's the great river that just pulls all the rocks. Ox and what, whatnot along with it, and the the fire that appears brighter to other people than to itself. Uh, at the same time, he has one about the um, the person who believes is he has influence is over other people. Well, ha you know, he has to give them free reign because if he doesn't, he's just gonna piss people off. Uh, which then seems to imply that this person who believes he has influence is, doesn't really. Whereas this person, you know, the the river just pulling rocks along with it, and then the fire that's brighter to other people than it is to itself, of uh, aren't really like going out to influence people. That's not their goal. Uh, they'll just they're just doing it of their own, uh, perhaps you know, greatness. Mm. Uh, that one, I, I was thinking, I was looking at that because I like that one about the, you mentioned about the people who have believe they have a strong inner influence on someone. Mm. I mean, I think. I, I see this all the time, actually. Um, I think I find this in my I, in my life. I see this, um, but like I think this is someone who wants to exert control. Mm. So he tries to grasp these people strongly, right? Um, I mean, I would I would definitely love to direct this device to a lot of people, even teachers. Mm. I think this device could easily go toward teachers. Um, mm. The more you grasp at your students, the more they're going to slip away. Mm. Um, yeah, it seems to be the river. Yes. All over them, like a river. Sounds weird, but... <laughs> um, the river one, I took more as like, um, almost like the will. 
Hmm. Uh, I think there was a kind of theme of um, what is a great man? Because this is going to become more prevalent in gay science. But like uh, a great man, is, he says this direct. He says uh, five twenty one. He says greatness is greatness means giving direction. Hmm. So uh, basically, greatness is giving direction to your will. And where does your will come from? He's got this whole idea that he's kind of it flows from the past, right? There's this kind of outpouring of ideas and attitudes about life that come to us from the past. And we all have this in us. We're all kind of uh, products of our history, basically, I mean, very simply. but And then we got to give those flow and direction and give them shape, and that's how you become great. And that's why, that's why I was taking everything about the river was actually kind of a weird metaphor for the will, I think. Mm. Okay. <laughs> I like how Schopenhauer made his way back. Yeah, he always does, for me. I, I try to get Schopenhauer back in here. <laughs> uh, let's see. You know what, we, what one made me sad? Oh, uh, God, I know which one it is. I, I, maybe you do. Um, is it 585? Let's see, let me check. Ooh, no. Uh, but this one, too. I like this one a lot. The people are uh, chewed up in the machine. Yeah, well, he's basically asking, what's the point of the machine if all oh, it is, is to one. do is to maintain the machine? Mm. Right? This is going to be, this is going to affect Nietzsche's thought much, much later in his life. What is, why, why do we live, right? Mm. His, his answer is going to be to make these great men you're talking about. Right. That's right. He's, he's, yeah. he's going to give that answer, right? Because the machine just can't be there to make the machine run for him. Mm -hmm. And it does seem rather bleak if all it is is we're just making the machine run another day. Kind of sounds like Schopenhauer a little. Yeah, it does, which sounds just terribly awful. Makes you want to commit suicide level. Yeah. Um, wow, why can I not find this? Which, which, um, what, are you, what are you looking for? The one where he talks about people being comforted. Uh, uh, involuntarily noble, no, modest man, no. Um, okay, well, let me throw in one while I'm looking. Five oh, ways. Is the one about the... Oh, great, great. number 510, I got it. I, I got it. Five ten. Grounds of consolation. When someone dies, one needs grounds wow. of consolation most of all, not so much as to assuage one's grief as to provide an excuse for the fact that one is easily consoled. It's just wow, sad. Mm. It's. I mean, I have to say, like, I'm not going to deny the truth of this, but it's scarily sad. Uh, but after I read it, I'm going to say yes. I think this is very, very true. Um, I mean, you go to a funeral and you got that person who's like, there's, there's always that person who is always like, yeah, it'll be okay. They're in a better place. Um, or this is just, you know, this is the best way things could have worked out. And um, uh, I think the scary conclusion is this person really wasn't that sad in the first place. <laughs> that is this, this the ultimate cynical, scary conclusion. But some of these people, I really think this is true. It's just because you weren't sad at every funeral we went to. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't I going know. around. Uh, I wasn't going around like giving reasons for it. But if I someone know. had asked, if someone had asked me, like, why aren't you crying? Like when I was more little. <laughs> it's it's right? like the strange, like the stranger or something. Exactly. Yeah. Like if some, you know, if someone had asked me, yeah, I would have just come up with something off the top of my head that sounded yeah. right. You know what I mean? Um, and I'm gonna say yeah, I'm gonna include myself in in the, in this group here. Um, I don't go around preaching this, mind you, but you know, if someone's gonna if somebody asks me at a funeral why I'm not crying, I'm gonna come up with something like that. Mm. I mean, of course, I mean it's really this is really difficult to parse. Of course, you know, of course there are people who are actually grieving. There are people who who had to go through this grief. I mean, this is does not apply to everyone, obviously. Uh, just, it's it's a very 
dangerous thought to run through your head while you are there. Um, and from now on, this thought will forever run through my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I remember the first time I'm a, a relative I, in law that I had never met and didn't really know the, their fa the family of this relative in law. Uh, I was asked to attend the funeral of this relative in law who I didn't know nor did not really know their family. It's like, what the hell do I <laughs> you know, I could see being in that situation is like, um, that's okay, they're not suffering anymore. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sure they're happier where they are now. It's like, I mean, what, what do you say? The, yeah, just imagine going to the funeral and, you know, just actually feeling guilty for not being sat to. I, I, I'm sure the first thing you, you tell yourself is this. This is totally like a scene out of The Stranger, by the I way. I know, it really why, is. Why didn't you cry at your mother's funeral? <laughs> this is like right out of The Stranger, Annie. Anyway. She wouldn't want me to. No, she, want, she would want me to be happy at our transition to a better place. <laughs> no, I, I actually I felt really bad there. You know, around me is the family, the, you know, uh, uh, his, his wife, uh, if, if for example, you know, she came up and talked to me, was like, ah, uh, this is the first time I've even seen a picture of this person. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> I thought 510 was really mm. scary, dangerous, but sharp. Like kind of like the the perf uh, what, uh, kind of a perfect aphorism. Mm. Um, I mean it I, it has its own place. It, it's 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 insightful. It sticks with you. Mm. Uh, it just as as an aphorism, it's mm. I thought it was excellent. Um, and I'll do I was one. Like five. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'll do one then that I thought was really good. It's not going to be kind of that way, but six oh five I liked. Um, occasional indulgence in independent opinions is stimulating, kind of like an itch, but if you proceed further in them, they scratch, we begin to scratch the spot until the end, we produce an open wound. Um, for example, Robert Solomon's idea that emotions are strategies of getting through the world has become an open wound on my mind. <laughs> To the point where it like it changes me when I look at people. Mm. It's this existentialist idea that like emotions are strategies. <sighs> I don't know what to do with it, but it never goes away, um, and yeah. it's very, very dangerous to me because it it makes me quite cynical, but I can't deny the truth of it. Mm. Yes, man, that's mm. <laughs> that one. That one hurt me pretty bad too. <laughs> No, no, hurt hit me pretty hard. That, that's that's the more appropriate word. I guess in internet speak, it cannot be unseen. Um, in our case, it can't be unread. Mm. So I like six oh five. Yeah, I kind of also like the in, kind of insinuation that these opinions make your life more difficult. Yeah, but you, you, I mean, when but when you got them, you don't give them up. And I, I wouldn't want to. Yeah. You keep on scratching that itch. Mm. Um, anyone? Do you, uh, had, I, you had one more? No, anyone else? I, I want to do another one. Uh, 508, we're going back and forth and back and forth. The open countryside. We <laughs> enjoy being in the open countryside so much because it has no opinion concerning <laughs> us. Wow. Again, wow. Uh, I, I mean, yes, the, the open countryside is freedom. Right. I mean, of course, it's freedom to go anywhere, but it's just that the freedom that no one is judging you is staring you right in the face. I mean, I'm happy Nietzsche just throws it back in your face. Like, there's no one there judging you now, now that you're in the countryside. I think this is really is the appeal for a lot of people. You go into the forest. Okay. No one will judge you. Could I update this then and say mm -hmm. we enjoy being on the Internet so much because it has no opinion concerning us? Wow. Well, at least opinions don't stick. Yeah. yeah. Could I could I update it to be the internet? I 
kind of like that because you're in your anonymity. Um, this is the whole appeal of uh, internet and ninjas too, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Um, this is why ninjas are. I think this is why ninjas are popular on the internet because people on the internet feel like ninjas, unseen attackers, and no one can spot a ninja. No. Right? And no one can spot an anonymous person either. So yeah, the internet can't. The internet can't catch you unless you, you know, talk about how no one should be, you know, attacking Britney Spears. Or something. You know what I mean, like, unless they call you out. Leave Brittany alone. <laughs> and I don't know. I think uh, the appeal of the American countryside for a lot of people is this. Even like, if if someone, you know, isn't it funny though that if we would, if if you live in the countryside, then it's the exact opposite. <sighs> yeah. Right, because when you're in the city, no one gives a damn about who you are. But in the countryside, they know who you are. <laughs> they watch you. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say some of us have more experience with this than others. So. I get I go for a walk with my daughter, and people tell me about about it next time I see them. Oh, you were walking for you in a car the other day with your child. <laughs> Yes, Nothing creepy about that. <laughs> yes, I was. I was. Thank you for mentioning it. I'm glad you saw me. <laughs> how the hell did you respond to that? It's creepy. <laughs> wow. Actually, wow. Maybe this. Uh, I can apply this. Like, um, what was it uh, Fleming? I kind of. Diver- Fleming has this theory. He has this theory about travel. If we do new track to this later, he'll talk about this. But. Um, I kind of gleaned out of this, like, a joy of travel is the fact that um, where you're going has no relation to you. Mm. Um, you. You approach the world not as meaningfully, more freely, right? You, you approach it aesthetically almost. Um, I mean, coming to Japan from America... They might walk into a supermarket and see, oh my god, that's yeah. so amazing, right? I walk in and I'm like, well, where's the bread? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you, whenever you bring, you know, somebody visits from America, they're always so, they enjoy convenience stores so much, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I... I, I really do think maybe yeah, maybe so maybe vacations are like vacations from the meaningfulness of life and maybe they could bring this into the countryside too. Um, in a strange way. I mean there's meaning still remains, but like not the same kind of meaning. Um, this is this is the attraction of Disneyland too though, isn't it? Now in a certain like it's a, it's an escape. Yeah, I mean it's a fantasy community where everything is perfect, yeah. Everything's perfect if it's overrun by mice. That's right. Big, but, but see, don't you mice. see? Disney is so perfect. The mice are cute. <laughs> <laughs> you want them to come to you. <laughs> mice, bring them over here. <laughs> uh, let's see. Any um, other individual ones? Let's see. I kind of like the uh, forty-seven. Forty-seven. Um, just because it seems to be describing otaku. No. Uh, I, I wish uh, I wish I had enough time to draw this theme out. I think there's something interesting going on here, but I can't. I, I wish I had more time to think about it. But yeah, this modesty toward ideas and toward people. Or uh, sorry, in passion toward ideas and then like losing that passion toward people. Yeah, it seems like you take. There's a lot of, uh, with um, one success. You you either take like human relationships or thinking. Thing. Let's see. Um, Can you make anything else? I want to do. Mm. Uh, I kind of like, well, this is very light, but 601 reminded me of that really famous uh, yes. Ogden Nash poem. 
don't know why that one race is logged in this poem. Love is a word that is constantly heard. Hate is a word that is not. Love, I am told, is more precious than gold. Love, I have read, is hot. But hate is the verb that to me is superb. And love, but a drug on the mart. Any kitty in school can love like a fool, but hating my boy is an art. <laughs> um, and yeah, I kind of like it. It kind of niches on this line, right? You got to learn to hate. Learn to hate well. Mm. Like the amazing atheist. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because yeah, hate involves of distrust. Now, I don't. I think we are not naturally inclined to distrust. Mm-hmm. You know, it takes it takes some conditioning to make people bitter. Yeah, not to be optimistic. <laughs> Like, I, was like, I, I kind of uh, this is an interesting and dangerous idea um, five, 512 of morality and quantity one, one man's morality is higher compared with another's often only because its goals are quantitatively greater the latter is drawn down by his narrowly bounded occupation with the petty now, it seems like um, um, it attaches with you know, with, this could be brought into um, the I think the Sarkeesian debate, debate, you know, with a lot of people well, and they're criticizing her of they're just video games. They seem to have uh, fallen victim of this, this type of mindset that places you know, uh, the value of morality on the quantity of uh, the scale of what they're looking at. I, I yeah, that, that critique still goes on, by the way, despite Tool Time's destruction of that argument. Yeah. I mean, when you really sit down and think about it, he's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you're the one that's getting excited too, right? So don't tell me it's just games, because in any other context, you wouldn't be saying that. Kind of reminds me of the teenager who I was always like, I don't care about you, man. I don't care about you. Yeah. I don't care about the world, but he's like crying. <laughs> yeah, right. You're kind of like, get a break. <laughs> yeah. What did you think about 509? Um, everyone superior in one thing. Mm. Um, it says, under civil conditions, everyone feels himself to be superior to everyone else in, at any rate, one thing. It is upon this the general mutual goodwill that exists depends in as much as everyone is someone who under certain circumstances is able to be helpful and thus feels free to accept help without a sense of shame. Right? So this our civility rests on this thin line that you feel superior in at least something. Um, and uh, if you didn't have that you might turn into kind of a hateful person who feels out of control. Um, I mean, I mean, just think about it in Japanese too. They like they say yakutatazu. Right? That's pretty. That's a pretty insulting thing to be told. Yeah. I think. Um, you can be of no help. Ever. Well, depends. It maybe it's situational, but <laughs> I would I would hate to be called yakutatazu. Mm. I I would if if I'm told if I've told that I I would I would not be happy. <laughs> uh, like yeah, I mean, don't you think that fits in? Like everyone says, like oh, yeah, everyone's special in their own unique way. I, uh, this is like the modern version of this, isn't it? So uh, yeah, yeah. Ooh, ooh, can I, I want to do one too? This one I really like too. So please tell me how you interpreted this um, before, maybe before I give my interpretation. Maybe maybe you both already have this interpretation, but I want to see I want to see if I was I, I, mine is unique. Um, in 503, envy mm -hmm. and jealousy. Envy and jealousy are the privy parts of the human soul. The comparison can be extended. Uh, the comparison can perhaps be extended. So, what was your interpretation of 503? Or do you have, I want to give mine. I like mine. Mm. I'm interested in hearing 
hearing yours. Yeah, this one didn't really stick with me that much. Okay, because uh, I, 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 right at first when I read it, I was like, okay, next. Uh, but when I went back, I really like this one, um, because uh, so this is my interpretation. Nietzsche thinks envy and jealousy are like uh, penis and balls, and uh, they're the penis of the human soul. And the comparison can be extended like this: Yes, envy and jealousy are the 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 shameful parts, but just like just like your genitals, they can be an extremely big motivation to get things done, and they can produce a lot. For example, children, or they can produce <laughs> uh, they can produce other things like you know what I mean. They can I don't know lots of good stuff. <laughs> right? Is that what he's? Is this? What do you think? Is this what Nietzsche's trying to say here? I think like, he was definitely thinking of penises and balls. Yeah, <laughs> penises. That's exactly like, at least that's kind of what I'm always thinking of. So <laughs> that's in a non-gay way. <laughs> uh, um, hmm. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about that. I actually, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. I don't know what to say. Mm. Wow. Well, now if you remember, Robert Solomon made a very convincing case that, um, was it jealousy? So yeah, he said jealousy is never productive. He's, you know, he... Was it envy? Envy uh, or jealousy? Which one was it? Yeah, he made that weird distinction yeah. between envy and jealousy, which, which I, I forget which one you... Uh, was, I which think one was, en envy was the one that he said was... It was oh, yeah, in... Yeah. 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 One. One was the envy for things that are rightfully. One was. Yeah. Jealousy was for things you felt that were things that were rightfully yours. Your rightfully yours. Envy was what you, you didn't that, think. Okay. I am. I got those two mixed up. But yeah. Okay. So, but he said envy was never productive. Yeah. Because by definition, it's your wanting things that aren't rightfully yours. There is which, that seemed fairly convincing. Hmm. Though, could you say that maybe based on Justin's interpretation of um, the previous that aphorism, that perhaps the jealousy would make you pursue a path to become the type of person who has a right to those things? Oh. Yeah, I mean, like I don't know. For his, his, isn't it weird? Like more think about his idea about envy. It's kind of like well then. Does envy exist, right? Because like eventually you're gonna be thinking like you know you envy it, but you're like that should be mine, right? Envy kind of flows into jealousy, doesn't it? Mm. I so mean like envy's the balls. Yeah, uh, jealousy's the penis. Okay, that's what you're talking about. Okay, right. yeah. Um, <laughs> but you I mean yeah? I suppose like on Robert Talman's, I mean like, technically you should just do. Right, you should stew in envy. Um, it feels like it would produce stuff, not such great stuff. I mean, he was really down on envy, and I, I don't have any big problem with that. But it feels like, and I mean, the world literature, Shakespeare, envy seems to make stuff happen. That's for sure. Mm. What do you say that envy was impotence, though, that nothing would happen? Whereas I don't know, I always wonder. Oh, wow, about this. the penis is coming back. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes. Because <laughs> jealousy made things happen for him. Remember, for so, Solomon. Okay, so jealousy, jealousy is the penis. Yeah. yeah. Envy yeah. the balls. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Maybe, I guess, that's, though his, um, the way he grouped emotions, and Solomon grouped emotions, they seem very, um, semantical. So, like he was defining an emotion in a, a way that met his his arguments towards them, especially with the distinction between envy and jealousy. Yeah, but if it's not, if that's not what envy is, what is it? <laughs> I, for the most part, I think you know a lot of people use envy and jealousy um, interchangeable. Yeah, but I mean, this at that point, like, I mean, this is this Robert so Solomon brought up that really interesting point. He said, um, "Is there some, perhaps something we recognize something about envy that we don't want to use the word uh, yeah. the way it was originally used, um, and we just 
equate them with jealousy because there's something we don't want to say about ourselves. We don't want to see about ourselves. Um, so yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, you could kind of, in a weird way, define envy out of existence. But I mean, so but if there's no di if there's no difference between envy and jealousy, then I mean, why not just for for categorical sake lump them both into one and say envy was this other thing. I don't know. I'm, 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 I agree. I see what you're going with this, but I kind of want to keep what Solomon's doing. Um, mm. I, I mean, words change. The meanings of words change, et cetera, mm. et cetera. But um, um, when you say envy, really, what do you mean then? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, Unless you mean just jealousy. I mean, if you just mean jealousy, okay, well, e equal sign. Though, yeah, it is curious that, you know, we have envy as the green-eyed monster. So envy is a monster. We don't really have a, have a eye-colored monster for jealousy, do we? Mm. So there's clearly a more... It's the one-eyed monster. Jealousy is the one-eyed monster. Oh, sorry, it's Back a penis. penis. Yeah. yeah, okay. Back to the penis. Okay. <laughs> You're just gonna keep pecking away at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's for our view counts, right? It's like Bing. Every time we mention Bing, we get money. Every time penis gets mentioned, we get more money. <laughs> oh. I wish there was something like penis.com that was paying me to say this, but. <laughs> Well, excuse me, I'm trying to erect an argument here. <laughs> yeah, please, you know, you keep the, you know, my line of thought is just going limp because you, people won't let me think. Well, come on. Oh, come on. Uh, at least, at least I was trying. <laughs> at All least right, I was trying. <laughs> Six twenty six twenty seven. Wow, let's get us out of this pun festival. Um, six twenty seven. I don't know. I'm not going to mention anything other than um, I, I, it's a very quotable line. Uh, One does encounter those inverted sorcerers who, instead of creating a world out of nothing, create nothingness out of the world. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is not what he's thinking about, but I read a lot into things, and some people take big things and read nothing into it. Like, uh, yeah, Memento was the story of a guy that should have used a camcorder. All right, well, <laughs> no, it wasn't. Memento is not the story of a guy that should have used a camcorder. I'm sorry. But some people will make that magical. They're the inverted sorcerers. We'll take a meaningful story and say, what's going on? Right? It's boring. Confused Matthew. <clears throat> Confused Matthew. Um, I, 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 I like 627. and I, I know that's not exactly what Nietzsche was going for. He wasn't thinking about movies, but that's what I thought of. Wow, I like that. I didn't, I didn't, wow, that's really good. I'm, actually, I have a, a question about 560. 560. Yeah. Um, danger and multiplicity. Yeah. With one talent more, or one often stands less sufficiently than with one fewer. I understand this. Mm. this you say, I actually, I actually looked this next part up, Jesse. Thank you, you, yeah. because I was very, very curious as to why, and you know, the why would you think a table would stand better with three legs? It does. It does. Yeah. That's, I looked know, it up on Google. You know, buggies, three three wheeled buggies are much more stable than four wheeled buggies too for babies. And uh, tripods for cameras yeah. are always three legged because they're on the same plane, right? They're all okay. coming up to a similar plane, right? They're just, but it's not true for a table. If you if one leg is shorter, right? It's 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 now on two focuses, right? So there's um, there's two planes that it's supporting yeah. instead of the one in the center, right? So if you I, yes, I I thought the exact same thought you did. And I actually looked on Google, is a three-legged table more stable than four? And the answer was yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> I, I did look this up. Right, maybe it's because I'm, I'm always following my, my tables here. 
Well's here. I got a really weird, weird like composite desk consisting of like two different dining room tables here. Here, this seem this seems shocking to me, but all right. If you yeah, if you you give me the tripod example, that makes perfect sense. All right. If you feel it shocking, you really don't have a leg to stand on. Oh. Well, with all fairness, is <laughs> my three legs don't seem to help me stand better. Wow. Is, is, this, is this the penis coming back? Yeah. <laughs> Again, with the penis humor. <laughs> Jesse, bring the penis back after he left it. <laughs> yes. Well... Yeah, the penis it seems to shrink back for a little while, but eventually so it, it grows to its form of strength. Yes, that's right. <laughs> and, you know what? Because we just have to keep getting our royalties here. Uh, but yeah, I think that's about it for me. Um, anybody have anything else? I think we covered the major themes. Mm. I'm content. Um, oh, uh, well, then I'll do one last one. Let's finish. Um, 534 I thought was really good. Um, I agree. Uh, I, th I thought it was excellent. I mean, this is oh. the point. Um, misfortune. I mean, really, people do treasure their misfortunes. People treasure their suffering. And, you know, like on your standard utilitarian, everyone's out for happiness view of the world. If someone said to you, oh, don't, aren't you lucky? You look like you've never suffered a day in your life. That's an insult. That's a straight up insult, and you don't like that at all. Anyone told you that, but told, said that to you, you'd be like, "No, I'm suffering every day." You'd brag about it. I just like the point. Like your yeah. suffering is valuable to you, and it add, it gives your life meaning. Yeah. Um, and this is a point people don't want to look at. Yeah, and even just you know, the idea of luckiness. You know, even we we separate the, you know, misfortune is a plus, uh, but even without misfortune, you know, luckiness is a Seems to be like a detraction, Jim. Like you didn't actually work for things. Mm. Oh, that's, that's really good too. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, okay. And you want it to look like you did it, right? Mm. You made the effort. You did the work. It didn't just happen, mm. right? You made it happen. Yeah. So why like, people are so so quick to refute the idea that maybe they have some sort of privilege? Mm. Like, you know, mm. I didn't get, I didn't get into that into Stanford because of my rich father. It was all me. That's a good point. Nice. I, I guess we're going to end too. 536, too, right on the same page. Sometimes one stays faithful to a cause only because its opponents are unfailingly tasteless. <laughs> I want to say this to both Anita Zarkeesian and her opponents. Wow. <laughs> both of them are unfailingly tasteless. So I have nowhere to go. <laughs> I don't <laughs> like either one. You got to be a third leg in the tripod. Yeah. Yeah. Are we going to go back down that alley? Are we? <laughs> <laughs> are we really bringing this back? <laughs> How are we end? Dustin, stop being such a dick. <laughs> <laughs> me, he meant me. Why did he come back to me? <laughs> I heard there's, I heard there's a big dick, dick in the Tokyo philosophical site. Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the guy right over there. <laughs> All right, that's it. I think I'm done. Anybody, anybody have anything else? No? All right, let's finish. All right.